around the world. The Spirit is moving and a voice is being heard. Welcome to The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford. You can write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. We'll give you that address again at the close of today's broadcast. But here now is David Langford. Hello, friends. This is Pastor David Langford. We'd like to welcome you today to the Voice of Evangelism International Ministries. It's always a blessing. It's always a great, great joy to be with you and to share from the Word of Almighty God. Without a doubt, we're living in a time and days of profuse and profound uncertainty. But in spite of the uncertainty, you and I can have a certitude, disposition, believing and knowing that with God, all things are possible to them that believe. I do want to say thank you for those of you who fasted and prayed with us, who sought the Lord diligently. It seems like every year now, we're having more and more people responding to this need of fasting. Matthew 17, 21, this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting, which says to me, there are some things that we must do more than pray, more than read our Bible, but we must fast if we are to see a move and a manifestation of God here in the time of the end. I believe it's coming. I believe when you study Revelation chapter 7, in spite of the wickedness, in spite of the chaos, in spite of the darkness, in spite of the calamitous situations in the earth, there's going to be a great, great number that come through great tribulation and have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. And I want to be a part of that deluge, that freshet, that flood of the outpouring of the Spirit of God, God is going to move in a very powerful, powerful way. Let me invite you, let me encourage you to attend the Age of Deception Conference. April the 5th through the 7th, registration will be on the 4th. That is a Thursday. Registration begins at 12 o'clock noon up until 6 p.m. Thursday evening. This is going to be a time of great blessings. It's going to be a time of renewal, a time of refreshing. Acts 3.19, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. That is speaking about a revival. And we've got one of the greatest cast of speakers. I'll be speaking, Steve Quell will be speaking, Brother Irvin Baxter will be speaking, president, founder of End Time Ministries, Russ Desdar, great, great speaker, great man of God, Brother Jimmy D. Smith, a personal friend of mine from Cleveland, Tennessee, a man I've known for over 35 years, a great, great servant of God, a great minister. You'll enjoy Jimmy D. Smith greatly, uh, his demeanor, his disposition. He's from the state of Mississippi, and he'll really make you feel comfortable, make you feel right at home with his southern style of preaching. And then, of course, we have the Hagmans. Joe and Doug Hagman will be speaking, and they will be helping us in this conference. Two great, great people of God who love the Lord, who are so faithful, who are so diligent, and so willing to share their platform with so many ministers and ministries. And last but not least, Hugo de Garris. Hugo de Garris, who presently lives in Sydney, Australia, will be flying him in, and uh, he will bless your heart with the knowledge of the end times, not from a biblical perspective, but from a secular perspective. And the reason I'm bringing him in, the church needs to hear the truth about what is taking place. And this man uh, is has got numerous PhDs. He's brilliant one of the smartest men I've ever had the privilege of meeting. Um, insight, unbelievable insight in artificial intelligence, what's converging, what's taking place, able to assess world situations. And even he's looking for a third world war. He doesn't realize how close he is. 
and understanding, discerning Bible prophecy. And again, yes, there is a $100 registration. You say, I wish you guys wouldn't do that. Well, it's going to cost me about $5,000 to fly Hugo de Garris from Sydney, Australia, into this city of Hickory. And, of course, cover his motel expenses and give him an honorarium. So these are what you're helping us with. You're not helping us to make money. You're helping us to cover the expenses of a meeting, the building, the sound system, the video, the hotels, the eats, travel expenses for all of these speakers. We don't, we're not cheap here. We don't ask people to come for nothing. The, the laborer is worthy of his hire. And so that's where your money is going if you question, well, what's my money going to do? And uh, that's, that's where your money goes. And uh, we, we need a minimum of 500 people just to break even. And I don't think we'll break even at 500. So the success of this conference is really determined on whether there will be another conference or not following. I'd love to have one there every year with the accessibility to so much interstate traffic. I mean, there's so much availability to get to this location, and this location can handle between uh, as, as small a crowd as 200 to 2,250 people. So the potential is there. The, 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 the success will be determined by the interest from the people of God. And uh, so many people tell me, oh, I wish I could be on a great Holy Ghost Spirit-filled service. Well, I know God will show up. And I know that God will bless you. I know that God will touch you. I know the anointing of the Holy Ghost will break the yokes, the chains, the fetters, and the shackles that hold so many hostage. God will move and God will pour out of his spirit. That's why we have been fasting. We're expecting God to move. As a matter of fact, I told my wife the other day, I'm going to do a tune-up fast the week before uh, the conference. I want to be on the very cutting edge of the leadership of the Holy Ghost of God. And I want you to receive bountifully from the Lord. So please go to our website, thevoiceofevangelism.com. Register there. The conference is entitled Age of Deception. Needless to say, we're living in the age of deception. When you have an experience with God, you understand his amazing grace, Titus 2.11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Christ Jesus. I was reading just the other day in Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 10, For the word of the Lord is a reproach unto them. They have no delight in it. What a grave tragedy when the word of God is a reproach to men and they have no delight in it. That's the exact opposite of Psalms 37, 4. Delight thyself also in the Lord. He shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. My, how much opportunity God affords every one of us to have a relationship with him, to have a relationship with him, a personal relationship with him. You can get in the presence of God, and your life will be changed. Psalm 16, verse 11 In thy presence is fullness of joy. In thy presence is fullness of joy. Psalms 51, 11. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. David's cry. Why? David had sinned. David had grieved the Holy Spirit of God. David had done something very grievous and that he committed adultery with Bathsheba and then he had her husband murdered. He had her husband murdered. David knew, David knew the significance of the Spirit of God. Thus, 
He said, cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. David had fear of God departing from him because of his sin. That fear, that reverence, that awe is gone today. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. God can leave. Samson wist not that God had left him. He wist not the word wist, W-I-S-T. Read it, Judges chapter 16. He wist not that God had left him. He didn't know God was gone. There's a lot of church people today don't know that God is gone. God has taken his flight. The Holy Ghost has taken flight. He's left because people today live in sin. They live in debauchery. They live in debasedness. They are wicked. They are vile. Yet they'll go to church on Sundays and say, I'm a child of God and live like hell the rest of the week. This ought not be, my friend. This ought not be. This is program number 16. Program number 16 on the time of the end. We're in Matthew chapter 24. We're going to pick up today in verse 33, but let's connect verse 32 with it. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When its branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise, ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the door. It is near even at the door. We are to know. We are to know the proximity, the nearness of Christ coming. Romans 13, 11, and that knowing the time, it is now high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. What day? The day of the Lord is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envyings, but put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. When's the last time you heard a preacher preach from that passage, Romans 13, 11, 12, 13, and 14? Put on Jesus Christ. Be clothed with the Holy Spirit of God in your life. Be clothed. Put on Christ. Put off the old nature. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Newness of life in Christ. Jesus says, no, my coming is near. How close is it? Even at the door, talking about proximity, talking about near in space, near in time, near in relationship, near, even at the doors. When do you open a door? You don't open the door when you're 12 feet from it. You don't open the door when you're six feet from it. You open the door when it's at hand. Your hand is at the knob. I remember in the 90s, I'm going to say it was around 1996, 1997. I had a tremendous spiritual experience in my life. I was sound asleep, and I sensed the presence of God at the foot of my bed. And I felt as though someone reached into my body and pulled me up and pulled my spirit out of my physical body, took me out the bedroom door, took me through the kitchen area, into the living room, and almost mashed my face in the front door. And in my spirit, I heard these words, it is near even at the door. It is near even at the door. And then the next thing I remember, my spirit went back into my body and I laid back down. You say, that's crazy. Well, it was to me too. 
but I felt like God was about to smash my face in the door, telling me proximity, telling me closeness, telling me relationship. It is near even at the door, at the door. And that is so true today. You see, a door is a passage. A door is a portal. A door can be opened. You can walk through it. A door can be closed, and you cannot get through it. You cannot get through it. There's coming a day, there's coming an hour when God will close the door on certain people. Listen to me. Genesis 6 and verse 3 says, My spirit will not always strive with man. My spirit will not always strive with man. It is a it is a dangerous thing. It is a dangerous thing to toy with God. In Genesis chapter 6 verse 16, a window shalt thou make to the ark and in it a cubic shalt thou finish it above. And the door of the ark shalt thou set in the sign thereof with lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. This door is a type of Jesus Christ. This door is a type of Jesus Christ. This door also depicts his humanity and that when they pierced his side, Forthwith came blood and water. He told Noah, you are to make a door for the ark and thou set it in the side thereof. Set it in the side thereof. God put Noah in the ark. God did something after he put Noah in the ark. He shut the door. He shuts the door. He shut the door. Doors, as I said, are a passage. They are an opening. They are a type of a portal to go through or to be shut, and you cannot get through. Matthew 25 Verse 1, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise, and five of them were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil and their lamps with their vessels. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are going out. The Greek says our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, The bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins. What were they doing? Knocking on the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. But his response was very simple. I don't know you. I know you not. I don't have a relationship with you. You thought you had one with me, but you did not. And then verse 13, watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. What happened? The door was closed. I used to preach a message years ago as an evangelist on my first 
leg of evangelism in my early ministry. Then I pastored for 27 years, and now for the last seven years this coming July, we've been back into evangelism. But I preached a message, why many will not be saved. Why many will not be saved. And I take my scripture text from Luke chapter 13, verse 24. Well, let's start at verse 29. Luke 13, 22. I think I said 29. Luke chapter 13, verse 22. And he went through the cities and villages teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. Then said one to him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, I want to emphasize, are there few that be saved? Or Lord, just how many will be saved? They knew it would be just a few. Here was Christ's response to their question, are there few that be saved? Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in, and they shall not be able. And I preached on why men will not be able to get in. And one of the reasons, and I haven't preached that message in 30, 35 years at least, One of the reasons men will not get in, they're going to seek too late because the door will have been shut. The door will have been shut. That's why it'll be too late. I was reading Flavus Josephus the other night. Even though men can sometimes foresee their destruction and their damnation, they are still unable to avoid it. Though men can see their utter ruin, destruction, and damnation, they still are unable to avoid it. Why? Why can they not avoid it? They seek at the wrong time. When the door is shut, the door is closed. Listen to me for just a moment today. Men have seen the peril, the danger, the calamity in going the way they're going. They see it. Yet, they don't avoid it. They know driving in this manner, recklessly, carelessly, speeding, and on top of that, drug up, doped up, drunk up, whatever. In their conscience, in their mind, they know I am in a perilous and dangerous place, but they don't avoid it, so they have a terrible automobile accident. Terrible. Horrendous. Horripilating. Horrific. God had prophesied, Jesus Christ had prophesied, there will not be left one stone upon another. Though they knew the ruin, the destruction, the chaos, the decimation, many Jewish people were unable to avoid it. What's wrong with us? Hardness of heart. Jesus said, strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I said, you will seek to enter in and shall not be able. When once the master of the house hath risen up and hath shut to the door, and you begin to stand without and to knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence ye are. I don't know you. Their response is, They'll begin to say, Lord, we've eaten, we've drank in thy presence. Thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. 
The reason they will not be saved is they seek at the wrong time when once the master of the house hath risen up and hath shut to the door. What does God say to the church at Laodicea in Revelation 3, 20? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. You have a door, the door of your heart. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and sup with him, and he shall sup with me. You see, that's symbolic of communion, the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, communion, the wafer, the grape juice. That's communion. There's no greater sacrament than communion. I remember my granddad just about every time he would pray, he would talk about communion with God, closeness, proximity, near. It is near, Jesus said here in Matthew 24 and 33. It is near. It is even at the door. Near, nigh are synonymous. They're the same words in the Greek Yet people seem to toy and play with God in a very reckless manner and state. Very reckless. Very, very, very reckless. Look with me at verse 34. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. The phrase this generation is a significant expression. It occurs 16 times in three of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John doesn't record it. This phrase is also characterized by other epithets. An epithet is a term to describe the character of a thing or circumstances. So Jesus is saying, this generation, I was talking to the generation, which would be around 30, 35 A.D. Approximately 40 years, Vespasian would attack Jerusalem. The emperor of Rome would die. Vespasian would go back and be crowned emperor. He had his son Titus. Titus goes back to Jerusalem and starts the systematic destruction and downfall of Jerusalem. As I was studying this out the other day, I'm trying to understand when Jesus said this, the present application and then the future application. Now, we know that these things, in a sense, a lot of these things I'm sharing here in Matthew 24 happened in that time frame around 70 A.D., but not the abomination of desolation. That is yet futuristic. The great tribulation is yet futuristic. The second advent of Christ is yet futuristic when Christ was giving this. But he also gave intimate present events and details that would take place, such as you won't see one stone left standing on another. Some historians believe there was gold mixed in the brick mortar, so they tore down every stone. Why? To get the gold out of the mortar joints. Jesus knew what he was talking about. But this is what we call a layered prophecy, a layered prophecy. In other words, this is the first layer, but there will be another layer that's been superimposed on this, my, your generation. And all of these things, Solomon said, there is nothing new under the sun, nothing new under the sun. What has been is going to be repeated. I'm paraphrasing here. It's going to happen again. It will happen again. So let's take an assessment of what was literally, physically taking place in the days 
of Jesus Christ and his ministry. How were the people living? What was their mindset? What was their disposition? Where were they? Where were they? So let's look at the phrase, verily, verily I send you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Let's look at them. Matthew 12, 38 through 41. Matthew 12, 38 through 41. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, And evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days, three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days, three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south shall rise up in the, king, in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. This is the witness that God's going to have to use against both generations. The generation in the ministry and life of Jesus and the generation of the second advent, second coming of Christ our Lord. He said to the Jews, here's the sign. Here's the sign to validate, to authenticate, to verify without any doubt who I am. I'm going to die. I'll be buried and I'll be in the earth three days, three days. And after that, I'm going to rise from the dead. That will verify validate, authenticate the reality of who I say I am. He said, Jonah, and I did a program on that several years ago. We went through the book of Jonah. Came preaching repentance. This is, the, this is what bothers me about modern Christianity today. What was the message of Jonah? Repent. Mark 1, 15, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Believe the gospel. Believe the gospel. Believe it. They don't want to believe it. And the message was repentance. And I know you hear all the time, love, 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 love. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. I know that. You don't have to tell me that anymore. You think I'm an idiot? I'm a buffoon? There's another side of God. Jesus talks about judgment. Jesus talks about guilt, condemnation. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. Oh, don't preach that kind of stuff. Jesus preached it. Don't talk about condemnation. Don't be judgmental. Hey, he said the whole city, the people, in the day of Jonah, in the city of Nineveh, they're going to rise up. They're going to condemn you. The queen of Sheba is going to rise up. She's going to condemn you because a greater than Solomon, a greater than Jonah is here. The son of the living God is here. Son of the living God. Let me point this out quickly while I'm here. Jesus is deemed at times in the scriptures, the son of God, the son of man, the son of God, the son of man. Why son of God? Deity. Why son of man? Humanity. Satan said to Jesus in Matthew chapter four, verse three, if thou be the son of God, command these stones be made bread. Then Jesus in Matthew eight twenty, speaking of himself says, the foxes have holes. 
the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Jesus never drew on his deity. Jesus said, the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Satan says, if thou be the Son of God. Now, one of the confusing scenarios here is somehow when we read John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Somehow that phrase makes us believe Jesus at one time did not exist. So when we read begotten, the father gave his only begotten son, we don't understand. It's not that when I begot my children, they were not. My wife and I conceived and they were brought forth. Jesus always existed. So when you see, you hear begotten of God, it's not as though he never existed and then God did this great miraculous conception and brought him forth. No, no, he was always there. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. Jesus has always been God. Jesus has been there all the time. Jesus is the mere manifestation of God. And we grapple with his deity. We grapple with his humanity. When you read the son of God, that's his deity. When you read the son of man, that's his humanity. Man, this is good teaching. I ought to get a big offering in the mail this week or on PayPal or something. People ought to support this kind of teaching and preaching because it's rich. It's endued with truth. What kind of a generation? Matthew 16, verses 3 and 4. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today. For the sky is red and the lowering. Oh, ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but ye cannot discern the signs of the time. A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. There shall no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. Let me emphasize both times, wicked, adulterous generation. Look at all the adultery. Look at all the fornication. Look at all the sodomites. Look at all the transgenderism. There's no such thing as a transgender. These people are gay, homosexuals. There's no such thing as a transgender. You take all the hormone replacement therapy you want. And I spell hormone, H-O-R-R-O-R. It's horror what these people, a man taking progesterone and estrogen and filling his body full of that. So he becomes feminine. He loses his facial hair. He becomes effeminate. Well, 1 Corinthians 6 and 9 says effeminate people don't inherit the kingdom of God. And then a woman, she loads up on testosterone. And then she begins to talk like a man. She ain't no man. She's a woman. That's deception. That is deceit. That is duplicitous. That's chicanery. That's a seducing spirit. If that's normal, why do you have to take all the replacement horror moan therapy? H-O-R-R-O-R. It's horror what they do to their bodies. Now, I'm a transgender that's hogwash. That's filth out of hell. You, you either a man or a woman. But this is the cynicism. So when you read a wicked, wicked, wicked and adulterous generation, that is the worst kind of wickedness that there is. And you're seeing it everywhere, every turn. It's everywhere in this world. You can't get from it. You can't get away from it. It's there. It's there in everything. It's there. Poneros, evil in a moral or spiritual sense. Wicked, malicious, mischievous. It's shrewd, it's cunning, it's subtle, it's crafty, perverted, 
And you know what it ultimately brings? Tragedy. Tragedy. Sin brings utter tragedy. Let's go on. Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. You see, people, just like today, they're wanting a sign. Everybody wants a sign. Mark chapter 8, verse 11 through 13. And the Pharisees came forth and began to question with him, seeking of him a sign from heaven, tempting him, tempting him. That's what the devil did. What were the Pharisees doing? Tempting him. Who tempts you? The devil. The devil was in the Pharisees. John 8, 44, ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. You see, the Pharisees and the Sadducees only came to fruition. They only came into existence after they were released from Babylonian captivity. When they were released from Babylonian captivity and allowed to go back to their land, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were created. Now, they created themselves. They weren't appointed of God because what they then did was this. They said, we need the oral law to interpret the written law. So they exalted, they highly lifted up the oral law over the written law. God gave Ten Commandments, that was it. They came along and added, I believe it's either 613 or 616 oral commandments to the 10. You can find out, Google it, 613, 616. I forget the number. But they said, we need an oral law to interpret the written law. So they put the oral law in supremacy to the written law. So there you have the Pharisees. And that's the leaven. That's the false doctrine. That's the false doctrine. So the Pharisees came forth and began to question with him, seeking of him a sign from heaven, tempting him, and he sighed. He sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why doth this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, there shall no sign be given unto this generation. And he left them and entered into the ship again, departed to the other side. He goes on. Beware, Mark 8, 15, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. Leaven, don't let nobody tell you different. Leaven represents sin, yeast. That's why it's unleavened bread. There's to be no yeast in the bread. Bread typify Jesus Christ. Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, false doctrine, false teachings. It's, it has permeated, it has permeated the church on a scale as never before. There's more hypocrisy, there's more lying, there's more cheating, there's more embezzlement, there's more corruption, there's more evil in the church, the body of Christ than ever before. Galatians 5 and 9. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. A little leaven. A little bit. It don't take much sin to ruin your life. You don't need a truckload. You don't need a wheelbarrow load of sin. Leaven to destroy your life. Just a little bit. One last passage about the generation. Luke chapter 7, beginning at verse 30, and the Pharisees and lawyers, these were lawyers, not uh, of, of law, documentation, real estate, criminal. These were lawyers of the law, the Mosaic law. But the Pharisees, this is Luke seven thirty. Luke chapter 7, beginning at verse 30. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. 
talking about John the Baptist. And the Lord said, Whereunto then shall I liken the men of this generation? And to what are they like? They are like unto children sitting in the marketplace and calling one to another, saying, We've piped unto you, and you've not danced. We have mourned to you, and you've not wept. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and ye say, He's got a devil. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and ye say, Behold, a gluttonous man, and a wine bimmer, a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of all her children. Let me try to help you quickly with this interpretation of what he said. Jesus is saying, John the Baptist and I, we've piped as in a wedding, but you've not danced. We have mourned with you as in a funeral, but you did not weep. John and I have given all, and yet we are still criticized, and you find profuse fault within our lives. This present generation is in like manner. You can do your best in this present world, and they will still trample all over you. As the Jews had no interest in the gospel and truth, so does this generation. People don't appreciate the Bible that is preached from the voice of evangelism. They don't appreciate it. If you only knew how many emails I answered a week, and these people don't support us, but I'm still kind and gracious enough to answer their emails. And half of them are trying to snare me and get me. One lady sent me an email the other day, and she attends a particular church. Her church is telling her she obviously doesn't need to marry the man she's messing with because he's been married before. I think she had been married before as well. I don't know all the story. That's why I don't get involved in those things because I don't want to be a part of their sin, neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure, Paul said to Timothy. But she wanted me to give her an answer that would validate her position with this other man. And here's what God spoke to my heart. I was, I was fasting. I was, some weeks ago, I was fasting. As soon as I read the email, here's what came into my spirit. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they might or as they must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. And Lord Spudmar said, give her that verse because that's where she goes to church and they're trying to give her good counsel and watch out for her soul. But she wanted me to say something that would contradict them, but God said, give her the word. I suppose she attends that church. I would hope she would support that church financially. I would hope she would do the right thing if that's who's counseling her and giving her advice. But she reached out of her church to me to say something contrary to the leadership. I don't know all the details. That's why I've told people before. I don't get involved in those situations. I, I, I just don't want to be involved in those situations. It's nothing personal. I just don't want to get there. But here's the key. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Let me back up to Hebrews 13, verse 7. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Now, the word conversation means lifestyle. Consider the end of their lifestyle. Look up the word conversation in the Greek, strong, exhaustive concordance. Conversation means lifestyle. Consider their conversation. As I said a moment ago, you can do your best. I present the gospel, yet I am attacked profusely. Now, I don't make it a habit of going out here and attacking personal individuals. 
But even when I preach a biblical doctrinal truth, I get attacked because that's where they're living, and they don't like me because I say scripturally what you're advocating, what you're appropriating, what you are embracing, what you are sticking to is error. And here's why, and I give them the Bible. You know, people say, you can't lose your salvation. So what does it mean in 1 Timothy 4.1? Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Sinners don't do that. They're already seduced. How can a sinner depart from the faith if he's never been in the faith? How can somebody fall away? Revelation 2, 5. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. You can't fall off a ladder till you get on it. You can't fall off the, the bed of a truck until you get on it. So who are these scriptures for? The dog returning to his vomit and the sow that was washed to the wallowing in the mire. Who are these Bible verses for if they're not for people who backslide and lose out with God? Who are they? When you're a sinner, you're lost. I hear it all the time. I, I, I loathe, I despise that statement. We're all sinners, saved by grace. I'm not a sinner. Hey, I am not a sinner. I was a sinner before I got saved. Now that I am saved, I'm a Christian. Now, if I sin, I miss the mark. But I'm not a sinner anymore. That's the most asinine, ludicrous statement to say, we're all sinners. So God ain't going to have any saved people in the church. God, God's not going to have any saved people to go in the rapture, the second advent. God's not going to have any holy people. Why? We're all sinners. Well, that's garbage. I said that's garbage. Don't tell me a lie. Don't hand me that garbage. I'm going to close with this verse. 1 Corinthians 6. 11, and such were some of you, what? Paul says, fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, abusers of themselves with mankind, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, Paul says, but ye are washed but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. I'm giving you Bible. I'm flat out telling you a drunk is not going to inherit the kingdom of God. You say, well, I'm, I, nobody plucked me out of God's hand. I'm still saved. No, you're not. You're backslid. You're backslid. That's why he says, don't be deceived. You're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. And I say this all the time. I'll say it again today before I leave. What's the difference in a sinner drunk and a Christian drunk? What's the difference in a sinner drunk and a Christian drunk? I'll tell you the difference. The Christian who's gotten drunk is departing from the faith. He's leaving God and going back to his old ways. Yeah. People say, oh, hey, they were never saved. So King David was never saved. Peter was never saved when he's cursing and swearing he doesn't know Jesus. Samson was never saved, though the anointing of God came upon him powerfully. No, those of you who believe that are the deceived ones. You've left your first love. Please, I invite you, I encourage you strongly today. I'm going to pick this back up next week. I didn't get finished. I knew I wouldn't. Register. Go to our website and register for this great, great conference. April the 5th through April the 7th. Registration is on April the 4th, Thursday. God bless you. I'll see you the Monday. Voice the Lord of Jesus Evangelism Christ. Evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020.